You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Welcome back to the It's Always Draft Season Podcast, part of the Packer Net Podcast Network. Jake Swink here, back with you guys on a magical Friday, as we are ever so close to the year 2023. I will be your guide over the next four months or so until the 2023 NFL Draft. So there's going to be a lot uh, with this episode for you guys and plenty more to come. Just from, uh, again, positional rankings are going to be coming soon. The first, I think, mock draft of the cycle here on the podcast will drop, you know, probably in a week or two. We'll be talking Senior Bowl. So there's a lot to get to um, in the coming weeks. This week, though, wanted to start out with some news. Wanted a quick update at some at, at a position, uh, just a trend and see where the guys are at right now in terms of where the media has them and just rumblings about the number one overall pick. We're going to talk a little bit of Texans Bears this week. And I think we're going to finish up, of course, with looking at the prospects for uh, the semifinal games of the college football playoff. Because that is tomorrow. That's going to be a, a lot of fun to watch. So I want to start with uh, LSU receiver Kayshawn Boutte. Uh, he is now officially in uh, for the 2023 NFL Draft after initially deciding not to declare a return to LSU. Now, I have no idea if this is why, but Jaden Daniels did decide to return uh, like, what, eight days ago, I think now, and Boutte, about six days later, decides I'm going to go to the draft. I, I'm not saying those are related, but I'm not not saying those are related. So, Boutte now, I think jumps right back into the conversation top five receivers in the class just because you look at where a lot of the guys are I mean I think Quentin Johnston is probably going to be the first receiver off the board it seems unlikely that anyone else would at this point just because again the athleticism size and really the refinement that we've seen from him in terms of you know these in breakers and the route tree what he can do post catch and, and again at 6'4", being a ball winner as well. So there's there's still there's three-phase success with him. He's going to test out of his mind, I think. You're going to see you know, the explosion drills, the leaping stuff. That's going to be impressive for him at the combine. And again, he's going to run fast as well. So you have the guy who's big, fast, great post-catch in a post-catch world. Like, yeah, he's going to be the first off the board. Going to be interesting to see where Jackson Smith and Jigba is evaluated. Again, we talked about him in the last episode of this podcast. To just where you know teams are going to be a little, he's going to be a little bit divisive, just because he's not going to be the most overwhelming athlete. But he's just a darn good separator who gets open. I think he can play some Z, some flanker, along with the playing in the slot. Should be a target hog in the NFL, though. I think he is. He is going to be a, a really good player. Uh, Jordan Addison's probably going to be in the first round conversation, of course. Uh, even though you know, again, he's a smaller guy, but. He's as smooth as silk. He can win down the field. He's got some. He's got some yak ability to him as well. So I think those three are going to start a lot of conversations. Josh Downs is going to be right in that conversation as well, near the end of the first round, most likely. Uh, if not, it'll be early round two for him. He's just that explosive. He's that dynamic of a player. He's that good of a route runner. Yes, he's another smaller guy, but man, I there might not be things that. Truly, there's not. I don't think there's that much of a difference between him and Addison, other than Addison's got more reps on the outside. But man, I I don't see much of a difference. So you've got those four, and then you've got a couple others like Rasheed Rice, Jalen Hyatt's might sneak into the first round just because he runs fast. He's kind of a one trick pony in my eyes, but he'll probably be up there. But now, Keishon Boutte, who's again the 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 stuff with him from this year is he was again coming into the season. He was one of the consensus top two receivers in, in the class because, again, we saw, you know, all the flashes. He had dealt with injuries. You know, he had a really good freshman season, 700 yards plus. That's that's pretty good. I know, you know, freshmen are consistently getting better and better earlier at the college level, but 
He was really good as a freshman. He was really dynamic. He was really good after the catch. Uh, you know, good body control. Okay with releases. Um, not the best separator per se in terms of this draft class, but he was still good at it. And again, strong hands. So he, he brought a lot to the table. And really what this year was going to be is, okay, Jaden Daniels is here. You know, you got a new coach. Like, can we get the best out of this player this year? And see him vault into, again, where he was being mocked before the season started in the top 10 to 15 picks. And he was either him or Smith and Jigba, right? But, you know, there was some weird rumblings, you know, early in the season about, you know, Instagram goes dark, you know, potential transfer right away out of the gate. After the Florida State game, which was not very good on his part, there were some effort questions there a lot on that film. When you watch, and even when you watch that game back, like just very odd game for him, end up sticking around, and you know, didn't have the best season overall. Uh, I think we had something like forty eight for five thirty eight and two. I'm gonna check those numbers really quick for you guys while we're here. But again, not like an overwhelmingly good season from him. But but the important thing I think to note is how much he played in the slot. And that is not something we saw from him previously. And it there really wasn't a question coming into the year about, oh, is this guy, you know, like with others, you know, Downs, Smith and Jigba, Addison, a lot of those guys were like, oh, can this guy play in, you know, can he play in on the perimeter? Can he not play in the slot? Like, is this, is this just a slot receiver? Butte was not, in that camp at all 2020 the grades in 2021 the grades were good they were 73 and 75 respectively yes it was 48 catches 538 yards two touchdowns this season but again when you look at the splits in terms of where he aligned you're looking now his freshman season 93 percent of his snaps were on the on the outside 93 percent now it was it was close to 50-50 last season just because quarterback wasn't very good. They wanted to give him some layups over the middle of the field. The quarterback, not not Butte himself, but Butte was in the middle of the field because they wanted to give that quarterback some layup throws and didn't want him to be threatening outside the numbers as much. It was not a good LSU team. So 52 to 47, 52% out wide. This season we have 28% of the time he's out wide and 72% of the time he's in the slot. Those are overwhelming numbers that have switched over two years now and just very weird. He didn't look as explosive, and I know that there was some injury-related stuff to that in terms of what was sapping a little bit of explosiveness from his game, but he still put out some some solid games. Uh, he had six for 115 against Florida. He had six for 107 and a touchdown against Georgia. It was a good game. He only caught seven for 51 against Bama, but I think he did a lot of his damage, and I think this will confirm that. He did have he did have 4.8 yards after the catch per reception. Um, again, he, there was some solid games, and you know I think with him, the analytical profile is going to look good. You're going to see, you know, a lot of guys put out you know the early declare. He had a pretty good market share as as a as a freshman. Um, so, so good numbers as a freshman, kind of an early breakout you would talk about. And again, analytically, that just means you were good younger. Uh, and he declares early. And and usually players who declare early are are often taken earlier, right? And, and draft capital certainly matters. Can he be a target hog in the slot? Absolutely. I just question a little bit more about, again, is this what what he has? Is this Is this new player from 2022 the player that he's always going to be? Or are, can we see more of the 2020, 2021 player that had, you know, a lot more explosiveness? We'll see. But he did look, I, I will say he did look smoother in the slot. And that's going to bring up, you know, again, I, I tweeted it earlier this week. It's like there's a lot of slot receivers in this class. If, if Butte can prove again, I think he's going to test well as well. So he'll have, you know, analytically and athletically a pretty good profile overall. Um, and he is like six foot two oh five, yeah. So I mean, you know, if he blocked a little bit better, um, I think you know, I think people would be more in on him. 
as a as a power slot type. So, and and Green Bay might be in on him as well. But yeah, the run blocking grades are not very good. So overall, you're looking at a smooth slot guy who's got some yak opportunities. He's got good body control, good tracker of the football. So I think he can win at every level. It's just can we see more of 2021 Butte than 2022 Butte back if he's fully healthy or whatever's been going on? That's the question. And, and will he sneak into the first round? That remains to be seen. We we will see. But that's the biggest update I wanted to talk about the most was was Keishon Butte de- deciding to declare. Looks like Zach Evans, running back from from Mississippi and formerly TCU, is also declaring for the draft. Really like him. I think with him, he has all the physical traits, the speed, contact balance, you know, staying shifty in space, pretty good receiver. For him, it's just about, again, processing between the tackles as a runner. If he can continue to do that, other, otherwise he's going to look a little bit like DeAndre Swift has, where Swift is, is, is bounce out king and, and really likes to play east-west ball instead of north-south ball, and that's cost him a lot of yardage. Um, and probably cost him a lot of snaps in Detroit this year, just being honest. So Evans needs to continue, continue to work on processing between the tackles, you know, zone power, whatever it be and, and hitting gaps, processing at, at, at a high level. And and he'll be again, a top five back in it, in an overwhelmingly good class. So a couple news and notes there. I do want to talk quickly about the quarterbacks, and I know we, we, we don't want to continuously talk about them necessarily in every episode, but it's a good little update here as we as we look to uh you know twenty twenty three and and you know we're we're about to be in the meat of draft season, just where these guys are at. And it's always interesting, I think, to go to NFL mock draft database because they have pretty much consensus in, in big boards and mock drafts as to where these guys are at right now. Uh as of now. Uh, Bryce Young is the top guy uh, in terms of the consensus big board just because, again, he's been going and people have been projecting him to go to the Texans at one the most out of anybody recently. So he's going to be the highest there. CJ Stroud is still second uh, at number at fourth overall. His best projection right now and his most likely projection, according to Mox, which obviously aren't totally insider based at all but have him going to the Panthers at eight, which I could see him being the fourth quarterback off the board, as crazy as it sounds, because I've talked about this. I think without the mobility, I think you have to bank on Stroud turning into a high-level processor, which he can be, and he has proven that that he can be a good processor, and he gets through his reads quick, sometimes too quick, but he, he's able to diagnose, get it, get into hot uh, you know, alerts with blitzes, He's, he's quick processing a lot of the time. It's just when things get muddied, he needs to, again, continue to be that guy he's been when he's at his peak, which is maneuvering in the pocket, stepping up, keeping things square, and being precise as a passer, which he has always been. So the mobility question is is going to be a thing, and he's going to have a chance to kind of prove that he belongs in the top echelon of this class Saturday against Georgia. It's going to be a big game for him. Right now, Will Levis is at number six overall, which is the highest he's been so far this year. Um, right now, projected to number five to Indianapolis. So that's not shocking. I do think Indianapolis is is kind of the fit Levis would would thrive in. I think it, a lot of it's going to come down to what the Colts do at, at, in terms of their head coach, offensive coordinator. They got a lot of things to figure out this offseason, but Will Levis feels like a Colts guy. He really does. Uh, but I wouldn't rule out the fact that Will Levis could go first overall to the Houston Texans. Would I take him there? No. Will the NFL take him there? Sure. Yeah. Because again, Bryce Young, we don't know how big Bryce Young is. Guys, he could be 5'8", 185. Legitimately. 5'8", 5'9", 185. That doesn't feel like first overall guaranteed to me, even though his film is clearly the best of all the guys right now. So I'm just saying, like, Bryce Young, number one, consensus feels a little early to me we're early in the process even though film should be king and this is where we should be at I'm just telling you based on again NFL teams are going to try to minimize risk you know they're not going to feed into outliers as much unless they're they have the strongest conviction about a player I just don't imagine that a guy this small is going to go first overall I just don't now 
that leads me into quarterback four, Anthony Richardson right now, who sits at 20th overall on the consensus board. Again, according to NFL Mock Draft Database, it's a great tool, but it, you know, and it, it compiles all this stuff. So Anthony Richardson has firmly moved into that first round in terms of consensus projections. And I think he belongs there. I think he's better than Will Levis right now. I think there's there's pocket instincts to talk about. I think he plays within the pocket a lot better than people give him credit for. Now, you know, you talk about accuracy issues, but you know, if we're going to talk accuracy issues and you're like, why is he a first round player? Then why are we talking about Will Levis as a first round player, right? He's got accuracy issues too. He does. So the idea that, oh, we can't talk about Richardson there. Listen, Richardson's elite rushing floor is going to put him in the first round. It is. It's it's elite rushing floor. He's a big player who can handle it as a rusher. Guaranteed he's in he's already being talked about in that first round. And 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 rightfully so. He's got a cannon for an arm. His arm's better than Levis's too. Just just a little flick of the wrist and and it's 50 yards on the line. He's flash a deep accuracy. He just needs to again, just building blocks, more consistency across the board and he's a young player who I think deserves to be given time. Because of the elite arm strength, the elite velocity, right? The, the flashes that are there. If we're going to talk about flashes, like him and Levis then should both be first-round picks or neither be first-round picks. That's just how it goes. So you can't put one in the bucket without the other in the bucket. So I would, if I were you, if you're in the betting market, you know, and, and you're thinking there, you're like, all right, you know, who should I bet on being the first overall pick for the Houston Texans? And I say, if you want to bet Bryce Young, you should. I don't think it's going to be Stroud anymore. I don't think they're picking Stroud first. Uh, I do think Stroud's going to be the fourth quarterback off the board. Just just saying that right now. If that's a bet you want to make, make it. Because I do think it'll be the fourth quarterback off the board. I would put money down on Will Levis first overall and Anthony Richardson first overall. Just place those bets right now. If you want to place four of them and put Young in there as well and put Will Anderson, do it. Do all four. You're going to get money. So... I just don't imagine that we should be locked into Bryce Young at one. But that's where the quarterbacks sit, and I think I'm going to talk about them, those four in detail, along with all the others. Once the declarations have officially come in, but there's going to be a lot of talk about some of the guys um, at the Senior Bowl. You know, we're going to talk about them. I believe Jake Hayner and Clayton Toon are, are two guys who are locked in there. Spencer Rattler still has to make a decision. It sounds like he's going back. Um, we're going to talk about Hendon Hooker, probably Tanner McKee. We'll talk Jaron Hall. So we'll talk about a lot of these guys a little bit more in, in the coming weeks. We'll see if we're going to go to two episodes per week because I do think there's just so much to cover that I think would be good to do uh, from a team perspective as well. We go through a lot of the team stuff, team building, and then we go on a prospect level. And that would be a good idea. I think we'll, we'll talk about it for sure, but there's just a lot to talk about with these guys. So we'll, we'll get into that for sure uh, in the coming weeks very shortly with, with these guys and kind of putting the final evals on them. So those are where the quarterbacks stand at the moment. Like I said, if you're a betting man, I would put Levis and Richardson first overall bets on the board right now while while they're while they're obscenely low. Because I think Levis is going to get to a point where the bet is a lot closer to even than you think. So just, just thinking out loud about where these guys could go. But right now, Richardson, like I said, projected 15th to the Jets. Be an excellent landing spot. I just think as of now, the the order in in the mocks right now. What's the order? I'm just gonna take a look just to just to kind of go through it. But like Houston at one, I, I feel like Seattle at three. You can probably rule it out. Not necessarily though. Um, let's rule out Seattle. So Houston, Arizona's probably locked in unless they trade Kyler, of course. So then it's Houston. Indianapolis, Atlanta at six, Detroit seven, Carolina eight, Vegas nine. So five through nine. That's gonna be the, the, the really the bidding war to move up to two where Chicago's at. There's gonna be a lot of talk about that for sure. Uh let's take a break here. We're gonna talk then about uh a couple teams in the top five and just what the direction could be for them. A little bit of an early taste there. And then we're going to talk about the Packers briefly, and then we'll talk about the prospects in the semifinal games.
Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. All right, back here. On the It's Always Draft Season podcast, part of the Packing Up Podcast Network. Yeah, so let's just start and I, and I to get ahead of things, but it feels like right now that Houston and Chicago are going to get the top two picks in the draft. Now, Houston has been playing really good ball recently, like really good ball, especially for a team that that when you look at, at, at it on paper, shouldn't be competing in any of these games. But they are. And so the issue is Houston's now won a second game. They beat Tennessee, right? So now they're only a half game ahead of the Bears for the number one pick in the draft. And as Packers fans who are mostly listening to this, that should scare you a little bit. Please root for Jacksonville this week to beat Houston. Okay? Because... I I don't I don't imagine the Bears win any more games. They play Detroit and Minnesota. Um, they could play spoiler to Detroit this week. Then it takes them out of the running. Um, because their strength of schedule, yeah. So I I imagine they're going to be four and thirteen or three and fourteen. There's no way they're going to win both games. Minnesota is still fighting for that number two seed. With San Francisco, they're going to be playing, I think, the entire way now. So, Chicago could lose both and be 3-14. and 14. That means you should be rooting for, for, for Jacksonville this week to get Houston to 2-13-1. And, and if they're 3-13-1 and, and they beat Indy in the finale, they're not going to have the first... They're potentially not going to have the first overall pick. So... If the Bears get it, it's fire sale time. There's going to be a bidding war to get to one for whoever wants the first quarterback off the board, and it's probably going to be an overpay. So the Bears are going to get a lot of return on capital that they want. So, Packers fans, root for root for Jacksonville, root for Indianapolis the next two weeks. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be less. I think the Bears are going to get a little bit less than they would with the second than the first overall pick, and every pick I think matters, right? in this division so again teams can make quick turnarounds bears might be one of them unfortunately but anyway let's talk about houston at at picks one and 11 right now uh and just as you go through the rounds like houston to me everyone's locked them into quarterback at one which is fine you know this it's probably gonna be a new coach i can't imagine lovey smith's gonna stick around you know you're they're gonna sell a new guy and like listen this is gonna be you you know we're gonna be taking this thing 
now with all these picks, you know, we've built a decent foundation from last year's draft. I actually think they did pretty well overall. If Christian Harris could hit for them, you know, as as a strong role player, then they're they're really cooking because Jalen Petrie's been 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 good this year. Derek Stingley has been solid this year. Maybe not up to the billing of a top five pick, uh, but like there there have been games where he has really been locked down. Uh, like I said, Petrie, I think sometimes tackling isn't the best for him. Uh, he tackles a little high, but like overall, like the instincts are there. You know, he's he's really strong in zone coverage. He's great at reading quarterbacks' eyes, breaking on the ball. So he makes the splash plays, and he's still a really solid player for 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 a second uh, round selection. I think Kenyon Green's been fine. Uh, he should be plenty solid enough to play on that offensive line. I think they should have taken Zion Johnson personally, but like that—that that was a good, a, a solid draft for them. I think I'm missing somebody, but like, the, oh, Damian Pierce. Damian Pierce has been been very good as a running back as well. So they've been they've been good um, in terms of. Uh, you know, where the foundation is laid. They still have Laramie Tunsil another year. I don't know if they're going to extend him, right? That's that's going to be the question. But I think they're going to have to talk about the quarterback position a ton. And if they don't like any of these guys, don't forget, if I'm not mistaken, I think they still have two firsts next year as well from Cleveland that could be wrong but I'm gonna check but like they are loaded enough I think to again they're probably not going to be insanely good contenders next year anyway right like you expect Tennessee to be back in a fine team Jacksonville's continuing to elevate so they're not going to be any higher than third and they're probably gonna be battling the Colts again for third place so Yes, so there are two selections for them in 2024. So that gives them the option to pass on this draft class if they don't love anybody because this is still a long rebuild for them. They could pass and they could take Will Anderson or Jalen Carter and that would make plenty fine sense. And then they add another guy at 11, right? They, there's going to be, so if they, so let's talk about this for Houston. Say say they go like Jalen Carter and Tyree Wilson. Well, your front is now insanely good with those two guys, Tyree Wilson, you know, impressive length, impressive disruption ability, you know, as as a pass rusher, Jalen Carter does everything well. I mean, there's just, he's, he's as good as they come as a defensive tackle prospect. So you get both of those guys and your defensive line is in great shape, right? And you have a lot more after that even to, to build around because you have, again, picks, 33, 65, and 73 as it stands right now. So five top 75 picks to once again load up. Now, if they want to get, you know, if they move Brandon Cooks, then, you know, you're going to talk about them as a team that goes after maybe Quentin Johnston. Maybe they're the first team to get a receiver off the board. And then they've got Quentin Johnston, Nico Collins, hopefully John Mechie coming back. Receiver room looks good, right? You know, and then they do, if they do that with Will Anderson, you know, they're going to be in that, you know, defensive tackle range in the second round and third round. That's, that's pretty good overall. You know, they could add, you know, a stud tight end. They could add another corner in the mix. They could get potentially the top linebacker at 33. Wouldn't rule that out necessarily. It's been hard to place guys like Trenton Simpson, Noah Sewell, and Drew Sanders in the first round. So they could get a top linebacker if they still want one. And again, they, they, that feels pretty good, and your secondary looks good. You know, they could add another safety. The sweet spot for the safety position is going to be on day two. So, like, they could really build the defense out and just say, okay, we're going to have everything ready for this quarterback when he arrives in 2024. That could be the way they go, and it wouldn't shock me necessarily. But then if they're going to do that, they better be locked in then with with Anderson or Carter. Um I don't think it makes any sense to necessarily sell that first overall pick because you're getting an elite talent there. But they could sell pick 11, potentially. And then that gives you more capital to mess around with. If that's what you're going to do, if that's what you're going to do is is go and wait for the quarterback, then, you know. But now let's say if they go the quarterback, then I think pairing the quarterback with a a number one receiver again, if Brandon Cooks is is indeed out of there. For me, it's, it's Bryce Young for Houston. I wouldn't pick anyone else. I, I might actually pick Anthony Richardson second if, if I had a choice to pick 
the next quarterback off the board. So Houston's going to have to make that decision then at quarterback. Then if they're moving Cooks, I still think Quentin Johnston's in play. If not, if they don't move Brandon Cooks, then I think, again, defensive line makes a lot of sense. You know, maybe find your center long term in, in, on day two or something like that. John Michael Schmitz is going to be very popular. Most mock drafters, if they need a center, are going to plug him in, um, which is fine. Uh, but he's a good zone center. Um, but yeah, that Houston's going to be in a position where they're going to dictate a lot of things, obviously, at the number one pick. And if they don't go quarterback, everything could break loose into haywire. Likely, though, I still think they pick the quarterback. Um, I just don't think it'll be Bryce Young. I would pick Bryce Young. Um, Chicago at two, it, it, it makes a ton of sense for them to just grab Will Anderson or Jalen Carter. But we think they're probably going to sell this pick. Uh, they could potentially, as much as this stinks, they could get both firsts from Detroit as that pick can continues to fall down the board with Detroit contending for a playoff spot. Right now they're at pick 18. So that pick with with seven right now could net the Bears. You know, you could be looking at Quentin Johnston and Peter Skaronsky both. Why do I think Skaronsky could be available at 18? Well, arm length. Is he going to play tackle, even though we should stop moving good tackles to guard? I think that the tackle isn't going to come off the board as quick. They could go like Broderick Jones, should he declare. There's going to be a lot of Georgia declares uh, in the next, you know, either five days if they're done after this game or, you know, what is it? it January 9th is the, is the, so so like 12 days from now, you're going to see a lot of them. So Chicago is going to be in a position to get receiver and tackle if that's what they want to do, build around fields, as they probably should do. Or you stick and you get Anderson or Carter. Chicago's got a lot of options, though. Again, Indianapolis, Atlanta, Carolina, Vegas, all teams that are probably going to be now moving up to get quarterback after Vegas. Benches Derek Carr, probably going to move on from him if they can. So then it gets very interesting, like I said, in that 5-9 to nine range about who's going to make the move. Who believes they want the second quarterback off the board? And the Bears are going to capitalize on that, probably net some day two picks next year as well. So you got to be prepared for that, right? And Houston and Chicago, good positions, again, to take elite players. But again, quarterback and trade back feels like where we're at right now with those two teams. And there's going to be a lot to talk about with, with how they build those teams very, very soon. Um, just because... Again, when you're Houston and you need the quarterback, it's going to depend on who you who you bring in as head coach too. There, there's going to be a if it's an offensive guy, then they're probably going to be locked in at quarterback, and they're going to and they're going to be up and down, you know, going through everything they can to be like this is our guy at the position. If they go a defensive guy, then you know there's no guarantee they still probably take the quarterback. But like if they if they're hiring a defensive coach, he's he's going to be really clamoring hard for one of these elite guys and maybe and just maybe you can move up from 11 to get your quarterback you know maybe seattle or arizona would like to sell or maybe chicago would like to sell to 11 and net you know a couple couple picks in 2024 houston's gonna have a lot of options they're gonna be very interesting because again they got a decent foundation the bears i think they got they got a good player in brisker jury's still out on kyler gordon Right. I, again, it's one year for a rookie corner. It's very, very difficult to have an elite season. Uh, Gardner and Woolen are the uh, are really the the exceptions to the rule, rather than the rule itself. But yeah, I mean, Braxton Jones has played solid for a day three pick at tackle. Absolutely. Um, so they they've got some guys. Velas Jones was not a good pick. We know this. Uh, but they did okay. They didn't do great in the draft last year. They did okay. So it'll be interesting to see where they go from there. But enough about those two teams. Let's talk about the Packers really quick here. Just an update. Obviously picking 17th at the moment. Uh, yeah, 17th. If you go through, if I go through the simulator right now and we just talk a little bit about how things could go up to pick 17. Let's see Houston takes their QB. Uh, they take their QB. Let's say it's let's say for for science, Will Levis, because you know Bryce Young's size 
turns them off. Bears don't trade. They get Anderson. Carter goes to Seattle. Arizona probably picks Miles Murphy or Tyree Wilson. Let's give them Murphy. Indianapolis takes their guy at quarterback. Since it's Levis is gone, let's have them take Richardson just for, again, science purposes. Falcons, they're going to go after somebody. They take Tyree Wilson. Detroit takes Bryce Young. Carolina takes Stroud. All the quarterbacks are off. The Raiders don't get anybody. Let's give the Raiders Brian Brzee. Let's give the Eagles, I think, the top corner in the draft, Christian Gonzalez. Houston gets Quentin Johnston. Seattle has taken Carter. They can now go corner. They could go edge. Let's give him Jared Verse, who's a very good player as an edge rusher. Tennessee. Tennessee's a tough one. Honestly, uh, they should take like Paris Johnson. Let's give him a tackle, even though they continually pick offensive linemen. They got to get it right at some point. Uh, let's give New England Broderick Jones. That gives the Jets potentially Peter Skaronsky at tackle, so three tackles in a row. Pittsburgh takes Joey Porter Jr. Okay, so that leaves a lot of receivers on the board for the Packers, right? It would be very difficult for them to not take somebody like Addison or Smith and Jigba. The problem is Smith and Jigba might not meet their athletic thresholds. Jordan Addison doesn't meet their size thresholds. This is why a lot of people have them mocking, have mock, have mocked them Michael Mayer tight end out of Notre Dame in the first round because it just feels like when you look everywhere else, at edge especially, you know you look at Isaiah Foskey that might that's probably going to be somebody the Packers like. Good run defender, you know, got to go to move as a pass rusher. Do they want to go that direction early? Tackle top three are off the board. Anton Harrison's a good player. Is that the player they want at 17? They obviously need safety. Right now, according to the consensus boards, Brian Branch, Antonio Johnson, Jordan Battle, Brandon Joseph, JL Skinner, top five safeties. Do I feel confident about any of those at pick 17? No. Which leaves me, uh, Bijan Robinson at running back as well, right? But, but, hear me out. Okay, so based on what the Packers have done recently, right, you're looking at David Bakhtiari probably sticking around. Zach Tom looks very good for for a fourth round rookie. They could Packers could get a second round pick if they put the second round tender on Yash Nyman and he walks and someone else signs him. Let's say they put it on and nobody picks it up. Now they have three tackles, three tackles for next year. You have Runyon and and Elton Jenkins. Now, it doesn't mean they shouldn't continue to reload that position. I think they will. Third, fourth, fifth round, right? Now, the Packers do have an out with Rasul Douglas if they want it, okay? They have that out. If they want to look elsewhere at corner because they don't feel confident in Eric Stokes right now, you know, Jair is going to be there long term, but if you don't feel confident in Stokes... Now's the time because corner is loaded. They could now, as I've said, we got Christian Gonzalez off the board and we got Joey Porter Jr. off the board. That's it. The cornerback class feels really loaded right now. Kayleigh Ringo is still on the board. Okay. Again, it's a Georgia corner who I think a lot of people are going to be like, mm, I don't know if I want to do that. Size, speed, athletic traits, ball skills. There's a lot to like there. Watch him in the game this week. He's got the, the probably the toughest matchup he's had all year. Marvin Harrison Jr. and Mika Abuka. Two excellent receivers who will be probably top 20 picks at least uh, in the 2024 NFL draft. He's going to get a, a really tough assignment this week. That's very exciting. If you want to get a look at Kele Ringo, it might be Keely Ringo. I don't know. We got to get the pronunciations. I promise we'll get them ready for draft time. But you got to look at him. I would look at Cam Smith as well. This is a big, long, physical man corner as well. South Carolina. And then there's my guy, Devin Witherspoon out of Illinois. Great tackler. Physical. Ball skills. Good in man coverage. Illinois asked him to be on an island a lot. 
and he delivered a lot. So don't be surprised, though, if the Packers look at corner and they'd be like, all right, you know, maybe Ringo and 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 Joey Porter Jr. Are off the board. Maybe they go Christian Gonzalez then, who's a really talented corner in his own right out of Oregon, who's already declared. So maybe the Eagles had taken Ringo. I just wouldn't rule out the idea of corner being the top pick for the Packers just based on the talent still available and their likelihood of not going early at receiver even though it's listed as their top need, it really shouldn't be. I just don't know if edge and defensive line outside of Brzee and, and Carter, Anderson, Verse, Murphy, and Wilson, if all of them are off the board, I think the Packers will look elsewhere. Trade down is possible. Again, Bijan Robinson and Michael Mayer, consensus top guys in their position. Would they be good picks? Absolutely. There's a lot of talk about what to do with Aaron Jones. It'd be nice to keep him, obviously, and restructure him. Then I still think they need a running back, too. As much as you know, a lot of people have liked what A.J. Dillon has done recently, be nice to find a power back in this class. Just saying. Roshan Johnson out of Texas would be a great pick later to fill A.J. Dillon's role. But they got to make that type, those type of decisions. I just wouldn't rule out the idea of corner being that Packers' first-round pick because... Just looking at it now after the Elton Jenkins extension, it feels like offensive line feels really good to them. Now, that doesn't mean, right, that doesn't mean now in four months' time if they feel like Skaronsky's their dude or Broderick Jones is their dude and they're available, they won't take him. That's not, there's no guarantees, right? It just feels a little bit, it would feel a little out of character to me to, to draft a safety way above where the consensus is right now. Um, just doesn't feel like there's a round one safety in this class at the moment. I've started grading. Right now, Chris Smith is the highest one of four guys. And yes, a couple of them are branch and battle. So unless Antonio Johnson blows me away, Chris Smith might be my safety one. Don't feel like we should be doing that at, at, at 17, personally, with all the talent still on the board. So there's a lot to, to unpack there. Jared Verse, I think, is going to be very much in that conversation, of course. But I do think the Packers could go there on day two, and there's a guy I think I would circle for them. I'll, I'll, I'll say it now. Why not? I, I would circle Derek Hall out of Auburn for, for the Packers right now at edge rusher. He fits a lot of what they like. I, I think that would be a slam dunk pick on the, in round two for them. Um, So, again, just don't rule out corner. Again, I think Smith and Jigba is a perfect fit for the Packers based on what they still need at receiver. I just don't think they'll do it, and that stinks. But again, don't. I think edge and corner are the two positions I'd be looking out for right now uh, for the Packers in the first round. Unless, of course, like I said, if Broderick Jones or Brian Brzee are available, I could see that. But I think edge and corner are where to look right now. So let's finish it out here. Let's finish the show out today talking about uh, the playoff games. And, and like I mentioned already, there there's, I think, two... Two guys in the consensus right now who should be talked about a ton, uh, who have a lot to prove, I think, in these big games. That is, of course, like I said, C.J. Stroud is the big name, to again, to watch in this game because how he's going to deal with a Georgia front that is going to bring heater after heater after heater at, at him. Right They're, they're going to be in his face. There's going to be disruption. There's going to be discomfort. Can C.J. Stroud handle it? Can he be poised in the pocket? Can he show the poise that Bryce Young has shown? Plenty in his film. Can Stroud show that? I'm hoping so, right? It'd be super cool if Stroud goes in and wins the game and, and does it on his back. That'd be sweet. He's got the weapons to do so. I think Harrison and Ibuka are going to be important threats uh, that, that are going to strain the Georgia defense a little bit. Julian Fleming's going to be very interesting because, again, he's a bigger guy. Might be throwing him in the slot a bit to take advantage of size mat, uh, of a size mismatch. But, again, Stroud is going to have to be d- decisive, on time, and accurate all game long. There are going to be shot plays. Needs to hit some, right? There are going to be times when George is bringing 6-7. He needs to make the right decision. He needs to understand where the pressure is coming from. Where do I need to put this ball? 
So there's going to be a lot for C.J. Stroud in this game that, that are going to show a lot of people, I think, whether or not he is deserving of being the first or second quarterback off the board. If he struggles a lot, I think that's going to be telling. So, so that's obviously the first guy to be watching. Again, everybody knows watch Jalen Carter every play because he's a freaking stud. Again, that's that's not shocking. He, he, he's probably going to have his way uh, against Luke Whipler and, and the interior guys. That won't shock me at all. It stinks that Nolan Smith isn't playing in this game because I think a matchup with him and Paris Johnson would be very fun to watch. Uh Still going to get some other guys out there like Robert Beal, um, who's a good player in his own right. A lot of these younger guys for Georgia are going to be on the edge. Uh, so again, definitely worth watching if you want to watch the young guys. They're going to they're going to give Paris Johnson again. Dewan Jones who's a lot bigger as a tackle. They're going to give them headaches for sure. So a lot of these young guys are going to get chances. Um, let's see, Mikel Williams, M.J. Sherman. You know, there's a lot of guys who are going to get run at the, at, the, at the quarterback. And it's going to be very interesting to see how how Dewan Jones, who's I think got a lot better, a lot more fleet-footed as a pass protector this year. And again, Paris Johnson, who's been really as advertised this year, but got to watch that two-hand punch. You know, be independent with your hands. Going to be a big deal in this game. Okay. Elsewhere, like we said, Kayle Ringo has... A big time opportunity. I, I think again, he everybody shows the pick that he had in the Tennessee game against Cedric Tillman. I think Cedric Tillman got the best of him a little bit, especially in the underneath routes. And if you got receivers who can, you know, be that everything's vertical for me, that type of player, they're gonna they're gonna get him to turn open early, and a lot of things underneath are gonna be open. Kelly Ringo has to be patient. And realize that he has the speed to recover vertically. He does. And I know giving up the big play is a dangerous thing. But when you have more speed than everybody else on the field, you have to realize that. I think that's important for Ringo is, again, he's going to be okay giving up the bunnies because they tell him, again, this is it, it, they're going to make sure they're not giving up big plays. And, and he knows it. But he, not, he needs to know that he's, he can be patient enough to have the speed, be physical. He's a big dude. Make these guys work for everything as well. Make them work for every yard. Harrison and Ubuka, make them work for every yard. It's going to be a big game for Ringo. I think same goes for Chris Smith, who I, I talk about as one of my favorite safeties in the draft. Because he is, again, a very good top-down player. His instincts are off the charts. He can make plays on the ball. He's a phenomenal tackler. He really does it all. He's going to be, a, I think, a really good NFL player because he's so sound fundamentally in zone coverage, he's great and reliable as a tackler in the box. And again, he can he can make plays at the moment of truth. He can pick passes off. He can disrupt at the catch point. He does it all. It's going to be a big game for him too. So those are guys that I, I think have the biggest bit to prove in this game. Ohio State has a couple safeties, Lathan Ransom and Ronnie Hickman, that are worth checking out uh, in this game as well. But, man, you want to watch a matchup. I don't know how much we're going to get of it. Again, because, again, Ohio State, they move their guy. We'll, we'll see. I, I Vaguely, actually, I think it, it does work because it feels like they've had JT Tumaloa, who's going to be a, a big-time 2024 pick. But, like, feels like they have him rushing off the right tackle a lot more often. So we should get a decent helping of Broderick Jones versus Zach Harrison. And... Broderick Jones may not have, I would say, the best anchor or the best hands. He gets a little wide at times, but he's a good pass protector. And boy, when this guy's pulling, look out. He is a great puller, a great space blocker, a phenomenal athlete. So that matchup in pass protection, Broderick Jones on the, at left tackle against Zach Harrison and or JT Tumaloao rushing the quarterback, maybe Jack Sawyer a little bit as well, another sophomore, going to be a good test for Broderick Jones. Uh, Cedric Van Pran, I've talked about him before at center for Georgia. I think he's a really cerebral player. Great angles, plenty powerful in the run game and as a pass protector, plenty of anchor on the interior. I think he plays the position just about as good as anybody in the country, truly, at center. I think he's a quite good player. I No guarantees he declares, but I've, I've talked about him a lot. 
right? And you, you've heard me talk about him. Uh, for Georgia, if there's anybody I'm missing, like I said, Nolan Smith not playing. That stinks. Um, yeah, I mean, the running backs for Georgia are always very interesting to look at. You know, McIntosh and Milton, both, you know, very smooth players, tough runners between the tackles. Both will probably fit the Packers. Um, if they decide to go that route, obviously Milton is a junior. He is yet to be 21. Uh, and McIntosh will be 23 in March. So Milton, a little bit younger, doesn't have to declare. McIntosh will likely be in this draft. So again, two guys were definitely worth checking out. Like I said, Robert Beal at 6'4", 255, rushing the passer for Georgia. He'll be in there. He's a fifth year senior. So Again, plenty of guys to check out, but of course, Packers. Packers need a tight end. Darnell Washington is hilariously funny to watch because he's just that much bigger than everybody at 6'7 and, and potentially like 270, 280. This is your Mercedes Lewis comp. That should be the comp, honestly. Um, dominant run blocker, always attached to the line, dangerous red zone threat. And, and dude is an incredible athlete enough to where he can leap guys in space. It's just funny to watch him. He is, it is hilariously funny to watch him against even Power 5 competition. Because he's just that much bigger and stronger. So, plenty in that one. I'm trying to think of anybody of Ohio State if I missed him. Tommy Eichenberg is a good linebacker. I think who, you know, who's going to get, you know, the same. Oh, he's, you know. A slower linebacker. He looks like Tough Borland. Plays much more instinctive ball than Tough Borland does. So definitely worth worth a look as well. Like I said, Zach Harrison will be against Broderick Jones most of the game. He's going to need to have a big game, I think, if Ohio State's going to win this game. So, again, plenty to watch for in that game. If we're talking, you know, TCU-Michigan. Yeah, I mean, the usual suspects. This is Quentin Johnston. Can he be a productive in a game that that matters a ton you know he had two really really big games mid-season the production's been madding maddeningly inconsistent can we see a little bit more from him in this game we'll see I don't yeah Blake Corum not playing that stinks um there's a couple receivers that Michigan boasts I mean Cornelius Johnson at 6'2", 211 is a big Strong, fast player. Ronnie Bell's the smooth operator, three level, three level receiver. Both are really solid players. Um, obviously, Luke Schoonmaker at tight end, six five two forty eight. Uh, he's already twenty four though at the position. But again, another guy that's again worth checking out because I think the the tight end class is really really loaded. Um, Ryan Hayes will be at the Senior Bowl. We talked about him a little bit before uh, in, in our prospects to watch. He'll be at the Senior Bowl, but 6'7", 301 tackle. I feel like the Packers are could be interested in him just because he's going to be a later pick uh, at tackle. Obviously, again, we've – Coach Hahn talked about – asked about this guy, Zach Zinter, at guard. He is phenomenal. Um, just a junior, though. So no idea if he declares. If he does, he might be you know the best guard in the draft. Honestly, other than, maybe other than Osiris Torrance, but like he doesn't have to declare. Um, Olu Oluwatimi at center for Michigan is a sixth year senior. I imagine he has to declare. Uh, he's probably twenty three, twenty four, um, but he's another one who plays the position really, really well. We're gonna get like if it's Georgia Michigan in the in the in the championship, we're gonna get like just really elite center play. Um. But Mozzie Smith, obviously, will be a will be on the Packers board. I think uh, he's going to be twenty one at draft time. Six three three twenty six, elite athlete um, was on, was number one, I think, on the on the Feldman Freaks list. Just needs to put it together a little bit more as a pass rusher. We've talked about him a lot. We've talked about him a ton. You know about it. Uh, he's going to have the opportunity to be the disruptor this week uh, against TCU. He needs to show it. Uh, I think DJ Turner is going to be the best matchup for um, for Quentin Johnston, six foot one eighty one at corner, a junior, a four redshirt junior. Gosh, uh, just absolutely fumbling right now. Um, but he's he's just a really good tackler. Uh, you know, I think 
he's 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 good in man coverage. He can be trusted on an island, and you know he he doesn't give you an inch. And it's going to be interesting to see if if Quentin Johnson can handle that physicality, or if they're going to fling him in the slot a bit as well. I, I'm sure Quentin Johnson's going to be moving all over the place. So it's going to be interesting to see how many times he gets lined up against DJ Turner, who I think is is not getting enough hype in this. Again, it's granted a loaded cornerback class, but still. For TCU, I mean, yeah, Steve Avila is a huge guard. Uh, that's going to be primarily what Mozzie Smith's going to be dealing with, I think. You know, at 6'4", 330, he's played like everywhere on this line. I think except right tackle, if I have that correct. But I've talked about him before. Uh, Travis Hodges Tomlinson is going to be that nickel type at 5'8", 180, but just does everything well to be able to be that nickel player. He, he plays his tail off, instinctive, ball skills, all of it. He's a good player. Really good player at corner. And then again, Kendra Miller, six foot two twenty, running back. He's really good speed wise. Uh has plenty of you know, I think ability to be a three down player. Um yeah, I mean he's he's really burst on the scene this year. And it shows he's gonna have to have a big game. So again, t- TCU skill positions, Miller and Johnston. All eyes on them when they're on offense. So, plenty to watch for in that in that game, um, even from a Packers standpoint or just from a draft standpoint. It's going to be two really fun games. I think. Hopefully, Ohio State can keep it close. I think TCU will keep it close. Um, but yeah, so that that's really it for this week. That was a lot. Uh, and there's like I said, I hopefully we can go to two episodes per week because I just feel like there's so much to cover with this draft, and I want to do, you know, the first full year. Uh, on the Packernet podcast feed doing this draft show. Obviously, we entered it April last year starting the show, so it was like going really fast. But I think there's just so much we could cover with it that we'll see maybe if we can switch it to a week. And I think we'll be able to do that. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Like I said, if you got draft questions, you know, you can put them on the Packernet Facebook page. You can find me at Jake NFL Draft on Twitter. Um, you can probably also send Ryan some on Patreon. Uh, those will probably be the first ones to get uh, to get shouted out and get an- questions answered um, on the pod if if there are questions from the Patreon community. But, yeah, I uh, hope you guys enjoy uh, the playoff games. Hopefully the Packers can come out with a win against Minnesota on Sunday. And I will see you guys uh, next Friday, hopefully, um, in the new year. And hope you guys enjoyed have enjoyed holiday season and are excited for a new year. It's going to be a good one, I think. Can't wait for it. I'll see you guys, like I said, next Friday.